This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Wow, good afternoon. It's lovely to see you all here. Um, I'm Giovanni Singleton, and I'm coordinator of the Launch Poems program. And uh, we are in the middle of our 19th season um, of presenting uh, amazing poets here at, at UC Berkeley. Um, today, we are celebrating the 50th anniversary of the publication of Frank O'Hara's Lunch Poems, from which um, the title of our program is taken. So please welcome the director of Lunch Poems, uh, Robert Hass, who will um, lead us off today with uh, a reading from the volume. Thank you. Um, Lunch Poems was begun by Zach Rogo, who is now a professor of creative writing at the University of Alaska uh, in um, Anchorage when he was working here as a staff person, I think in the economics department. And um, um, Natalie, her, whose last name isn't coming to me, um, senior moment, who uh, was a graduate student here and is now director of the um, uh, Wallace Stevens Society and a professor of English. Anyway, they wanted a casual lunchtime poetry reading and uh, hit upon the wonderful idea of calling it Lunch Poems after Frank O'Hara's delicious book. Um, a couple of people here showed me their copies. I have somewhere my original 1964 copy of this book. Um, so I was, I was in my second year of graduate school when I got a hold of lunch poems. And I, the best way to describe it's impact, what, the one thing that we all knew about poetry because of modernism and Le Mot, Juste, and Ezra Pound was that it was careful, that writing was careful. And then Frank O'Hara published these poems. Um, that changed people's idea about what was possible in poetry. He died at 40. He, he did not, he, he was a, um, he was like a kingfisher flying across a pond. You got this beautiful flash of color and then it was over. So it's thrilling but and poignant to uh, remember him today. I thought I would read the last poem in, uh, in lunch poems. It, because it gets a, a, a couple of things about the flavor. That is, it, he's talking about movies, um, uh, f famous composer, contemporary composers, and about Allen Ginsberg being sick in the bathroom, all in the same poem. This was when you might very well read this and not know who Allen Ginsberg was. It was uh, his friends showed up in, in poems. He said at this time, it was the f famous thing he said, that only two poets, William Carlos Williams and Hart Crane, were as much fun as the movies. And the movies, not meaning art film, but the movies, that is, the pleasure of fantasy, uh, shows up in his work a lot, as it does here. Fantasy. How do you like the music of Adolf Deutsch? I like it. I like it better than Max Steiner's. Take his score for Northern Pursuit. The Helmut, Helmut Dantin theme was, and then the window fell on my hand. Errol Flynn was skiing by, down, 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 went the grim gray submarine under the cold ice. Helmut was safely ashore on the ice. What dreams, what incredible fantasies of snow farts will this all lead to? I don't know. I have stopped thinking like a sled dog. The main thing is to tell a story. It's almost very important. Imagine throwing away the avalanche as so early in the movie. 
Navy. I am the only spy left in Canada. But just because I am alone in the snow doesn't necessarily mean I'm a Nazi. Let's see, two aspirins, a vitamin C tablet, and some baking soda should do the trick. That's practically an Alka-Seltzer. Al, and come out of the bathroom and take it. I think someone put butter on my skis instead of wax. Ouch, the lean-to is falling over in the furs, and there is another fatter spy here. They didn't tell me they sent him. Well, that takes care of him. Boy, were those huskies hungry. Alan, <laughs> are you feeling any better? Yes, I'm crazy about Helmet Dineteen, but I'm glad that Canada will remain free. Just free, that's all. I'll never argue with the movies. <laughs> Frank O'Hara. Thanks very much. Great, thank you, Bob. Um, so next we have um, Joseph Bush, who's a longtime Lunch Poems volunteer. Thanks. When I was uh, asked to do a poem, one of my favorites of his, just before the reading, I, I said yes before I realized I don't have my reading glasses with me. Uh, so that's why she gave me the book with the poem already in place, so I, at least I can find it. Uh, <laughs> well, okay, they add 10 years to me, but I don't care. Poem, Lana Turner has collapsed. I was trotting along and suddenly it started raining and snowing. And you said it was hailing, but hailing hits you on the head hard. So it was really snowing and raining. And I was in such a hurry to meet you, but the traffic was acting exactly like the sky. And suddenly I see a headline, Lana Turner has collapsed. There is no snow in Hollywood. There is no rain in California. Ain't that the truth? I have been to lots of parties and acted perfectly disgraceful, but I never actually collapsed. Oh, Lana Turner, we love you. Get up. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Um, so next we have uh, Jane Gregory. Um, she's a PhD candidate in the Department of English at, um, here at Berkeley. And her first book of poems, My Enemies, which is a wonderful collection, uh, was published in 2013. Please welcome Jane Gregory. So I'm reading this poem called Poem. It's nine lines long but it only takes like four for him to get to this place that's, I think, totally transcendent, but also still really rooted in being social. So that's why I chose this one. Poem. Instant coffee with slightly sour cream in it and a phone call to the, to the beyond, which doesn't seem to be coming any nearer. Ah, oh, daddy, I want to stay drunk many days on the poetry of a new friend, my life held precariously in the seeing hands of others, there and my impossibilities. Is this love, now that the first love has finally died, where there were no impossibilities? Uh, next is Elaine Kattenberger. She's the publisher and executive director of City Lights Booksellers and Publishers, where she has edited many books of fiction, nonfiction, and poetry, both uh, emerging and award-winning authors. Um, she's also the program director of the City Lights Foundation. And of course, City Lights published Lunch Poems by Frank O'Hara. Please welcome Elaine. It's really nice to see all you here. Um, I know you wish that Lawrence Ferlinghetti was here. I'm a, not much of a stand-in for Lawrence. But um, of course, it was Lawrence that, who was the one who wanted to publish this so badly and waited a number of years for Frank to finally 
send in the poems. Um, there's some correspondence in the book that documents those years. Um, there's a little word about the edition that Ferlinghetti wrote, and I'll just read you a tiny bit of that. Um, the correspondence between O'Hara and myself stretched on for several long years. Unfortunately, some of my letters were lost, including one in which I jumped up and down, waving my arms and hollering that I must have lunch immediately or I would starve. It worked. When these poems were at last published in 1964, they established a certain tone, a certain turn of phrase, a certain urbane wit, at once gay and straight, that came to identify the New York School of Poets in the 1960s and 70s. The poems articulated a consciousness that was unique among the poetic sensibilities around the world, which the Pocket Poet series was attempting to publish. Um, and definitely reading through these poems in preparation for this again and looking at them again, you know, I can, and knowing Lawrence as well as I do now after all of these years, I can completely see what it was about Frank O'Hara's work that attracted him to it so much. I want to acknowledge Robert Sherrard, who's here in the audience. And Robert is the editor, a longtime editor at City Lights. And it was his idea, actually, um, as the 50th anniversary was approaching, that we should do an anniversary edition. So um, we definitely should thank Robert for that. Um, I chose a poem called Ave Maria. I tend to like the funny ones. Um, and this is one of those. I have to take my glasses off. Mothers of America, let your kids go to the movies. Get them out of the house so they won't know what you're up to. It's true that fresh air is good for the body, but what about the soul? The soul that grows in darkness, embossed by silvery images, and when you grow old, as grow old you must, they won't hate you. They won't criticize you. They won't know. They'll be in some glamorous country they first saw on a Saturday afternoon or playing hooky. They might even be grateful to you for their first sexual experience, which only cost you a quarter and didn't upset the peaceful home. <laughs> they will know where candy bars come from and gratuitous bags of popcorn, as gratuitous as leaving the movie before it's over with a pleasant stranger whose apartment is in the Heaven on Earth building near the Williamsburg Bridge. Oh, mothers, you will have made the little tykes so happy. Because if nobody does pick them up in the movies, they won't know the difference. And if somebody does, it'll be sheer gravy. And they'll have been truly entertained either way, instead of hanging around the yard or up in their room, hating you prematurely since you won't have done anything horribly mean yet, except keeping them from the darker joys. It's unforgivable, the latter. So don't blame me if you won't take this advice and the family breaks up and your children grow old and blind in front of a TV set, seeing movies you wouldn't let them see when they were young. <laughs> OK, um, next we have Owen Hill. Um, his most recent book of poems is A Walk Among the Bogus from Lavender Ink Press. He's currently at work annotating a new edition of Ray Raymond Chandler's novel, The Big Sleep. Whoa. And he also helps out um, by providing books here at our events through Moe's Books. Please welcome Owen. And uh, as a worker at the book table, I want to point out how beautiful the new edition is with those letters that no one has seen before, except maybe Lawrence and uh, Bob Sherrard. Thank you, Bob, for, for bringing those out for us. I'm going to read uh, Anrak Mananoff's birthday. Quick, a last poem before I go off my rocker. Oh, Rock Mananoff, Onset, Massachusetts. Is it the Fig Newton playing the horn? Thundering windows of hell, will your tubes ever break into powder? Oh, my palace of oranges, junk shop, stables, umber, basalt. I'm a child again when I was really miserable, a grope pizzicato. My pocket of rhinestone, yo-yo, carpenter's pencil, amethyst, hypo, campaign button. Is the room full of smoke? Shit on the soup, let it burn. So it's, a, so it's back. You'll never be mentally sober. Thank you. 
Next, we have uh, Evan Clavon. He's a fourth year uh, PhD student here at Berkeley, also in the English department. Um, he writes poems, and um, more than one of which has been significantly indebted to the work of Frank O'Hara. Please welcome Evan. So I'm going to read Frank O'Hara's elegy for Billie Holiday, uh, Lady Day. Um, and it's one of O'Hara's poems that specifically I've tried to steal things from. Um, but I've also been thinking about it this week because I had to read for a class Wordsworth's uh, Tintern Abbey and Marjorie Levinson's essay that points out um, how the date that Wordsworth puts on there uh, is a sort of coded reference to Bastille Day. And of course, O'Hara's poem uh, mentions its relation to Bastille Day. So I like to think about how this poem might be actually potentially related to Wordsworth um, and thinking about how Levinson talks about the Wordsworth poem in an Adornian way as like lyric song that is not um, addressing the social. And so thinking about O'Hara and his interest in this sort of song that is obviously engaging with the social. The day lady died. It is 12.20 in New York, a Friday, three days after Bastille Day. Yes, it is 1959, and I go get a shoe shine, because I will get off the 419 in East Hampton at 7.15 and then go straight to dinner, and I don't know the people who will feed me. I walk up the muggy street beginning to sun and have a hamburger and a malted and buy an ugly new world writing to see what the poets in Ghana are doing these days. I go on to the bank and Miss Stillwagon, first name Linda I once heard, doesn't even look up my balance for once in her life. And in the Golden Griffin, I get a little Verlaine for Patsy with drawings by Bonnard, although I do think of Hesiod translated Richard Lattimore or Brendan Behan's new play or La Balcon or La Negre of Genet, but I don't. I stick with Verlaine after practically going to sleep with quandariness. And for Mike, I just stroll into the Park Lane liquor store and ask for a bottle of Strega. And then I go back where I came from to Sixth Avenue and the tobacconist in the Ziegfeld Theater and casually ask for a carton of Galoises and a carton of Picayunes and a New York Post with her face on it. And I am sweating a lot by now and thinking of leaning on the John door in the five spot while she whispered a song along the keyboard to Mal Waldron and everyone and I stopped breathing. So many people wanted to read that poem. Thank you, Evan. Um, so I'm Giovanni Singleton, and uh, this is where I work. Um, I'd like to read a poem entitled, actually, Five Poems. Um, one, well now, hold on. Maybe I won't go to sleep at all, and it'll be a beautiful white night or else I'll collapse completely from nerves and be calm as a rug or bottle of pills, or suddenly I'll be off Montauk, swimming and loving it and not caring where. Two, an invitation to lunch. How do you like that? When I only have 16 cents and two packages of yogurt. There's a lesson in that, isn't there? Like in Chinese poetry, when a leaf falls? Hold off on the yogurt till the very last, when everything may improve. Three, at the Ron Point, they were eating an, or an oyster. But here, we were dropping by sculptures and seeing some paintings and the smasheroo grates of Cateret and music by Varese. Two, well, Adolf Gottlieb, I guess you are the hero of this day, along with venison and Bill. I'll sleep on the yogurt and dream of the Persian Gulf. Four, which I did it was wonderful to be in bed again and the knock on my door for once signified, hi there, and on the deafening walk 
to the ghettos where bombs have gone off lately, left by subway violators. I knew why I love taxis. Yes, subways are only fun when you're feeling sexy. And who feels sexy after the Blue Angel? Well, maybe a little bit. Five, I seem to be defying fate, or am I avoiding it? So our, um, our final reader uh, this afternoon is Matthew Zapruda. He's the author most recently of Sun Bear from Copper Canyon Press and of Why Poetry, a book of prose is forthcoming from Eco Press in 2015. He lives in Oakland. Please welcome Matthew. Uh, thanks. Um, thank you, Giovanni, for setting this amazing event up. Thank you, Elaine. Um, Thanks, City Lights, for publishing this book. I, I can't think of a book of poems that's meant more to me over the years. Um, and every time I come back to it, I feel like a lucky apprentice again. Um, I was, I had a whole list of poems that I was sure, and I was sure I could just sit there crossing things off. I figured I'd be last to read, as I often am. And um, I was sure I'd just cross them off, and then I'd have maybe one or two left. But it turns out that none of the poems I wanted to read were read, and all the poems that were read were amazing and so well read. So um, yeah, I decided that I would read, the experience of reading the book, I remember the first time reading so many of these poems and the different things they taught me, so it was really also hard to choose in that way. And I think in the end, I decided to read um, poem, Khrushchev is Coming on the Right Day. I think it just embodies so much of what O'Hara does, the, all the different things you can do, all the, not all of them, of course. Poem, Khrushchev is coming on the right day. The cool, graced light is pushed off the enormous glass piers by hard wind, and everything is tossing, hurrying on up. This country has everything but politesse, a Puerto Rican cab driver says and five different girls I see look like Pidey Gimbel, with her blonde hair tossing too, as she looked when I pushed her little daughter on the swing on the lawn. It was also windy. Last night we went to a movie and came out. UNESCO is greater than Beckett, Vincent said. That's what I think. Blueberry blintzes and Khrushchev was probably being carped at in Washington. No politesse. Vincent tells me about his mother's trip to Sweden. Hans tells us about his father's life in Sweden. It sounds like Grace Hartigan's painting Sweden. So I go home to bed and names drift through my head. Purgatoria Mercado, Gerhard Schwartz and Gaspar Gonzalez, all unknown figures of the early morning as I go to work. Where does the evil of the year go? when September takes New York and turns it into ozone stalagmites, deposits of light. So I get back up, make coffee, and read Francois Villon, his life so dark. New York seems blinding, and my tie is blowing up the street. I wish it would blow off, though it is cold and somewhat warms my neck. As the train bears Khrushchev on to Pennsylvania Station, and the light seems to be eternal, and joy seems to be inexorable. I'm foolish enough always to find it in wind. Okay, well, thank you all for coming. Um, we do have copies of Lunch Poems available for sale. It's been in print continuously for 50 years. So please help us celebrate. Thank you.